back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Okaku. Every week on Science Fantastic, we profile the amazing, jaw-dropping scientific discoveries that are touching our lives and changing our worldview. And with us today is Dr. Seth Shostak, the Dean of the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. That's the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. That's right. Today we're going to talk about the science of of aliens in outer space. We're not talking about the new Star Wars movie. We're talking about how PhD physicists view the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We should point out that he got his bachelor's degree from Princeton, PhD from Caltech, and is the author of a book, Confessions of an Alien Hunter. So, Seth, once again, glad you could be on Science Fantastic. Always a pleasure, Michio. Okay, well, let's just jump right into some of the stories. One of the big stories, of course, dominating the headlines is the fact that the U.S. Pentagon had a secret study to analyze UFOs from out of space. Now, we're not talking about mom and pop looking in the sky and seeing some kind of thing hovering overhead. We're talking about jet fighter pilots. We're talking about military people that have recorded strange anomalies that make your skin crawl. Well, first of all, Seth, what's your take about this UFO story? Well, I think it's an extraordinarily interesting story, and I think the public also agrees. Uh, when you, you know, sort of cruise the Internet, you'll find this story is everywhere. And uh, that simply testifies to the fact that the public uh, is not only interested in the possibility that the aliens might be visiting, but in the case of one-third of them, they, they think there's truth to it. They think the aliens are visiting, and... Of course, if you ask them, well, why is it that so few scientists are convinced, they'll say it's because the government is keeping the good evidence secret. And this story kind of gives a little bit of vindication to that point of view because it says that, well, gosh darn, you know, the government really has been covering something up. Okay, well, as you know, roughly 95% or so of UFO stories can be dismissed as natural phenomenon. The planet Venus, radar echoes, atmospheric anomalies, all of these things can set off UFO alarms. However, the last 5% make your skin crawl. We're talking about jet fighter pilots tracking by radar and by visual sighting something something that is flying nearby and outracing them, seemingly defying the known laws of terrestrial physics. So what are your take about the remaining 5% that physicists have looked at and has simply scratched their heads? Well, listen, I don't know how many of them have actually been looked at by physicists. There are reports. It's true. And it's not just military pilots. Commercial pilots see things. I've talked to some of the Apollo astronauts. At least two of them were, were convinced that, uh, you know, some extraterrestrials were sailing their saucers through our skies. But the fact that, you know, 5%, 10% of the reported UFO sightings can't be explained, or at least haven't been explained, I mean, I don't find that a particularly strong argument. Not on that basis would I say, well, that proves it. The aliens are here. I mean, you know, uh, the, uh, the the homicides in New York, uh, maybe 65% of them are solved by the New York Police Department, but 35% of them are not. And uh, you could say, well, those are pretty puzzling. Uh, maybe those people were murdered by aliens. Well, maybe they were, but on the other hand, that seems like a kind of unlikely explanation. So the fact that a small percentage of the sightings cannot be explained just means that you don't have very good evidence. At least that's what it means to me. I don't find it as... You know, it's kind of a negative argument uh, that the, the, the unexplained ones are, in fact, alien craft. Okay, well, when some military men see something whizzing across the radar screen, maybe it's a radar echo. Or maybe it's the planet Venus, which seems to follow you when you are driving a car, for example, and Venus is behind your shoulder. However, to explain these things that are flying alongside our jet pilots, do you think that maybe they're drones? Being tested well, by the military. In case. I mean, that's been offered as an explanation for some of these more interesting sightings. That, after all, there are things up in the sky that are 
uh, not generally known about because the military doesn't tell us everything about what they're flying around. And drones have become more and more popular, so it certainly could be drones. But, you know, when people say, look, this object was flying faster than any aircraft we have, well, you know that in order to know what speed it's flying at, you have to know its motion across the sky, its angular speed, but you also need to know its distance. And it's very hard to know the distance to some object if you have no idea what its size is. I mean, it, it, it could be an alien craft at a mile distance, or it could be a bug, you know, three feet in front of your face. And you need to know how this is in order to know the speed. So uh, these descriptions, I think, say more about our brains than they do about the objects in the sky. And it was funded to the tune of $22 million a year. Do you think that was a, a waste of taxpayers' money, or do you think that the government should be using our federal funds to analyze these potential anomalies? Because who knows what's out there? What are your thoughts? Well, I actually have no problem with the $22 million. I have to say that's far more <laughs> than it's being spent to, you know, to, the, to try and find evidence of extraterrestrials via uh, big radio telescopes, the kind of work that we do here. I mean, our budgets are 100 times smaller. And, you know, one can look at this only sort of, uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> kind of uh, I, big question marks appear above my head when I think about it. But on the other hand, really, I don't have any problem with that because there may be something that is found. It's always possible. One shouldn't say, you know, a priori, it's impossible for the aliens to have come here. Well, it doesn't violate physics for them to come here. It's hard. But, hey, you know, let's, let's look into it. It also, by the way, uh, sort of, I think, camps down this constant drumbeat of complaint that the government really knows that we're being visited and won't tell us. I mean, that's, that's worth looking at. But I think that from the government's point of view, there's an ancillary benefit, and that is that, you know, they're worried that maybe some of these things are uh, Russian craft or Chinese craft. I mean, that's always been a motivation for the government to study these objects. Now, you notice that the program was canceled in 2012, at least that's what was claimed, and that suggests that the evidence... Uh, you know, it wasn't worth the money anymore, that there wasn't anything interesting coming out of the program. Okay, and when people come to me and they say that they've been abducted by flying saucers from outer space, I tell them, for God's sake, the next time you're abducted, steal something. I don't care what it is, a paperclip, a weight, uh, any alien technology, steal it, because otherwise you have nothing. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, we're talking about aliens from outer space, from the point of view of Ph.D. physicists. So we're not talking about mom and pop looking up in the sky and saying, oh, my God, look, there's a hovering craft right over the farm. No, we're talking about what is measurable testable and falsifiable because that's what science is all about and with once again our special guest today is the senior astronomer of the SETI Institute in Mountain View California and the SETI Institute is one of the premier organizations of scientists looking for the possibility of one day listening in on intelligent conversations in outer space so Seth let me ask you a personal question and that is how did you as a young kid get interested in the idea of searching for aliens in outer space? And what inspired me is probably not at all unusual. As a kid, and I can remember this happening all the time, beginning at about eight, age eight or nine, I would go to the movies every weekend, and uh, there were a lot of sci-fi films, and the uh, aliens played a big role. They're, you know, really great heavies for them. For the movies, because after all, they, they can be as ugly as you want, and they can have whatever abilities you want, and uh, they're pretty disgusting usually in the movies. So that was an idea that uh, sort of got into my mind that maybe there's somebody out there. And then I got interested in astronomy. You know, I think that's also common. I used to go to the Hayden Planetarium in New York and stuff like that. And by age 10, I'd build a telescope and so forth. But I didn't actually turn any of this 
into, if you will, a more professional effort until, until uh, after graduate school. I did uh, work in radio astronomy in graduate school, and at one point it occurred to me that techniques used for that kind of research were exactly the kind of techniques that might turn up some alien transmissions. Okay, now let's talk about science. Frank Drake, an astronomer in the 1950s, I think it was, came up with a a ballpark equation by which you could mathematically estimate how many alien civilizations are out there. And people today talk about Drake's equation. So can you give us a quick summary of Drake's equation? Yeah, sure. You're right. Frank Drake actually did the first modern SETI experiment using an antenna in West Virginia in 1960. And in 1961, he held a small conference with a dozen people, the first ever SETI conference, also in West Virginia, by the way. And as an agenda for that conference, he wrote down this equation. So that was 1961. It's called the Drake Equation, and it is said to be the second most well-known equation in science after E equals MC squared. But all it is was, uh, as I say, an agenda for a meeting, but the idea is that it is designed to compute N is the number of transmitting societies in the Milky Way galaxy. And obviously that depends on how many stars out there have planets and how, what fraction of those planets are, you know, salubrious, the kind that could support life. What fraction of those actually develop life? What fraction of the ones that develop life ever develop technology? How long do they stay on the air? It turns out there are seven terms in this very simple equation, but you will find it in every astronomy textbook because it has become very famous, and it's a great way to actually sort of formulate the problem of looking for life in space. Now, let's take a look at Drake's equation. You start with the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and then you start to whittle them down, down to the number of stars that look like our sun, that have planets going around them, that may have Earth-like planets going around them with liquid oceans. And when you do this equation, and you start with a ballpark figure of how many stars there are in the galaxy, whittle it down to what is reasonable to expect in terms of having liquid oceans and intelligent life. What number do you come up with? What are some of the numbers you get when you crunch the numbers trying to calculate how many stars and planets are there in the Milky Way that resemble ours? Actually, it's a little hard to crunch all the numbers down because there are some terms in the equation that are totally unknown. Like what fraction of planets that you know have life? I mean, they got some sort of biology. What fraction of those ever produce intelligent life? Life that's clever enough to build a radio transmitter? I mean, we have no idea what that that number might be, what that fraction might be, and we didn't have any idea in 1961 either when Frank came up with this equation. But what we do know is the following, and this is fairly recent. I mean, the past five or ten years, that roughly, roughly one in five stars has a planet that might be similar enough to Earth to, you know, spawn some life. In other words, with liquid oceans and feed, I mean, liquid water, something like that, uh, an atmosphere, these sorts of things. So one in five, well, given the number of stars in the Milky Way, that tells you right away that there are on the order of 100 billion cousins of Earth out there, not even counting the moons, because, you know, moons could be uh, inhabited too, at least the good ones. So it's a big number. That's 100 billion in our galaxy. And we can see two trillion other galaxies. So unless some sort of miracle has happened here on Earth, there are people who think that, but I'm not one of them, then there's got to be a lot of cosmic company out there. So what you're saying is that when you look at the night sky tonight, somebody could be looking back at you because one in five stars have planets, Earth-like planets perhaps, that maybe could be one day found to be doppelgangers of the planet Earth. So you're saying that Earth-like planets could be the norm when we look outside. Is that what you're saying? Well, not entirely. I mean, it's planets are the norm. That's the more solid result. At least, I don't know, 70, 80 percent of all stars have planets. Well, 70 or 80 percent, that's as good as all, right? I mean, hardly any difference. So... You know, you look out at the night sky, you see stars. Now, unfortunately, the kind of stars you actually see with your eyes are the big, very luminous stars, and they live such a short time, they probably don't have any life around them. But all the other stars you don't see, which, are, of course, are by far the majority of the stars, 
most of them have planets. If you make the assumption they all have planets, you're not terribly far wrong. But if you have planets, you usually don't get just one planet. I mean, we're finding that out now more and more. You get, you know, a handful of planets, maybe two handfuls of planets. Our own solar system has eight. Maybe someday it'll have nine again. Whatever. Okay, so there are just lots of planets. There are trillion planets out there in the galaxy. But not all of those planets are good. I mean, you know, a lot of them are going to be like Jupiter or Mercury or something. I mean, they're not terribly hospitable. That's why I say that maybe one in five of those systems there has a planet that might support life. So that's still an enormous number. Now, whenever I watch Star Trek and the Enterprise circles around an Earth-like planet, Spock says that they found a Class M planet like the Earth. Well, sorry, there's no such thing as a Class M planet. However, perhaps in the future when we do have starships like that, Earth-like planets could be rather plentiful, right? I mean, just a few weeks ago, a new solar system was discovered with, what, eight planets going around it? It seems that every week, a new discovery is being made, finding more complicated solar systems, many of which contain Earth-like planets, right? Well, that seems to be the trend, for sure. The problem has been planets around other stars weren't actually found until the 1990s, the mid-1990s. And I can remember as a kid, you know, again, going uh, to uh, 84th Street and to the Hayden Planetarium in New York, and they would tell you, well, we don't know. Planets might be very rare. I mean, yes, obviously the sun has planets. There were nine back then. But that might not be the general way of things. Well, that was wrong. That's something we found beginning in the 1990s, that planets are really as common as cheap motels. So that's a good start, but the point is that the equipment that is available now to find planets around other stars and maybe even to study them a little bit, that keeps getting better and better because this is a very hot research topic. And, uh, you know, we found thousands of planets. We don't see them yet. But as soon as we can actually see them, not just feel their effects, then you might be able to find out, well, does that planet have some oxygen in its atmosphere? Because if it does, you might say, well, that's kind of suggestive. Okay, well, so far the Kepler satellite has identified 4,000 planets, many of them Jupiter-sized, orbiting around other star systems. Has the SETI Institute, therefore, aimed its radio telescopes at some of these solar systems? Now that we know that they have planets going around, have they analyzed in detail the possibility of radio emissions coming from them? Well, we used to do that as a you know matter of course. Whenever we learned that a new solar system had been found, even if it was a solar system consisting of one planet, I mean, there could be other planets that simply hadn't been discovered yet or around that same star. So we would aim, indeed, our antennas in the direction of those stars known to have planets. But these days, we don't do that anymore. It's not that we don't think that, well, life is probably going to be on planets. It's just that since such a high percentage of stars have planets, you know, it's a better strategy from our point of view to just look at as many nearby stars as we can on the assumption that most of them have Okay. Planets. Seth, we have to take a short commercial break. Once again, you are listening to Science Fantastic. After the break, we're going to continue the discussion of the science of looking for alien civilizations in outer space. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, we're talking about aliens from outer space. Not the kind of aliens you see in the latest Star Trek movie. No, we're talking about how scientists, how physicists, armed with radio telescopes and the latest in terms of satellite technology, how they are scanning the universe for signs of intelligent civilizations in outer space. With us today is the dean of this process, Dr. Seth Shostak, senior astronomer of the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. SETI meaning the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So, Seth, I understand that your organization, of course, depends largely on private funds. But because of generous contributions uh, from wealthy billionaires in Silicon Valley, your facility in Hat Creek outside San Francisco is teeming with activity. Could you explain to us what's happening with your latest generation of radio telescopes? 
Yeah, Bishu, I, I only wish that <laughs> that were true. Uh, it is true that a uh, Russian billionaire who indeed lives, you know, here in the Silicon Valley, Yuri Milner, uh, has given money to do SETI, but not to the SETI Institute and not to the Allen Telescope Array in Hat Creek, California. He has given that money to the University of California, Berkeley, and they have a SETI program. Uh, with that money, it sort of amounts to $10 million a year for a decade. That is the, the promise. They have been renting uh, time on big antennas around the world. They don't have their own facility, but they rent time on these large antennas, and uh, they've been doing some work. So now we, we have competitors, if you will, uh, across the bay. They're rather better funded than we are because we depend on, as you say, donation. And, uh, you know, when somebody sends a $20 bill or $50 bill here, that's what uh, keeps the SETI project going. There's no government money for this. This is a misconception that a lot of people do have. Uh, it is not of a massive program. It isn't funded by anyone's tax dollars in this country. So the total effort in SETI is actually quite small. I mean, uh, the, my local fast food hamburger place has more employees than uh, any SETI operation that I know of. And I understand that uh, at Berkeley, there's something called SETI at Home, where you can use a screensaver on your PC at night to crunch some of the numbers coming from the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico. And maybe you, Joe Blow, uh, someplace in uh, the hinterlands, will pick up signals from intelligent life in the universe. So tell us a little bit about things like SETI at Home. Yes, indeed. That's a very successful uh, project, and it is, as you say, uh, run by the University of California, Berkeley. It's, it's about 10 years old now, maybe more. It was an idea that uh, was, in fact, devised by some folks up in uh, the Seattle area, and they thought, you know, hey, the kind of number crunching that's done for SETI is perfect for home computers. So, you know, people have their home computers on and all they're doing is looking at the flying toasters or maybe they're scrolling through their Facebook feed or who knows what. But, you know, their computer has plenty of leftover power. Maybe they could be enlisted to help produce some of that SETI data. And so they wrote some software to do that. It became SETI at home. That's, by the way, uh, said to be the, the largest computer or, you know, the biggest computer, whatever, in the world if you just reckon how much computation is being done. You know, I don't know how many people have downloaded the screensaver. It's on the order of 10 million. I don't know how many of them are running SETI at home, but they've got it. It's free, and people can still do that, and it does help the Berkeley Group reduce some of their data. It's, it's a wonderful program, and there, actually there are derivatives of that uh, sort of distributed computing model that are used for working out. How okay, to Seth, protein. we have to take another short commercial break, but after the break, we're going to continue our discussion of aliens from outer space. We'll talk about ancient aliens from outer space, and then we'll talk about the future. Once again, this is Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku, our special guest today, Dr. Seth Shostak, senior astronomer of the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Once again on Science Fantastic, we profile some of the most amazing developments in science. And with us today is the Dean of Looking for <gasps> Alien Civilizations in Outer Space. With us today is Dr. Seth Shostak. Well, Seth, I was turning on the TV once traveling in Europe, and on the TV screen there was the History Channel, and there was a program called Ancient Aliens. Now, I turned on the TV set, and there you were, talking about aliens from outer space. But, of course, they cut into your interview uh, footages of, well, hieroglyphic-like imagery that look like somebody with a space suit. Or maybe it was just a ceremonial costume of some Aztec king uh, thousands of years ago. So what are your thoughts uh, about whether or not aliens might have already visited us in the past? Can you rule it out, or it's just one of those things where you simply shrug your shoulders? Well, I... <laughs> I do shrug my shoulders a bit. Uh, the ancient aliens, you know, I think it's been on the air for at least nine years, and it may be ten years. It's, you know, it's renewed every season. It's very, very popular, and people do talk to me about it, and I have been in, indeed, several of those seasons, many of those seasons. Uh, 
uh, it's, it's kind of a fun show, but the premise here is that, for example, the, the aliens have been around in historic times. It says ancient aliens, but, of course, you know, 2,000, 5,000 years ago, that isn't very ancient as far as the, uh, the Earth is concerned, or not even very ancient as far as Homo sapiens is concerned, but nonetheless. So, you know, it addresses questions like uh, the most obvious one, well, who built the Egyptian pyramids? You know, could the Egyptians have done that, or did they have alien help? And as I say, the premise here is that they had alien help. I, I, I've been to the pyramids a couple of times. I, I think that the Egyptians built them, actually, and you can actually see some of the some of the, uh, you know, the, the earthen works where they ran out of money for certain projects and couldn't finish them. I, I don't think that actually the Egyptians needed alien help to build that stuff. And I know that I, this is always a puzzle to me, that while many people accept the fact that the, you know, even the pyramids of Central America, which after all, you know, the Mayan and uh, pyramids, they weren't built very long ago, maybe hundreds of years ago, but not thousands. They were built hundreds of years ago. But those people must have had alien help, whereas if you look at the Colosseum in Rome, which was built 2,000 years ago, nobody questions that. Oh, yeah, well, that was built by the Romans. So it seems that there are certain cultures that are incapable of civil engineering. Okay, well, in the movie 2001, it has a totally different take on the question that maybe they're on the moon. Maybe they did visit us, but the moon is quite stable. There's no erosion there to speak of. And maybe they set up a listening post on the moon just to observe the evolution of life on the Earth, a very good vantage point. And lo and behold, uh, here's the Homo sapien rising, and they give us a little boost every once in a while. So what are your thoughts about things like the movie 2001, which puts alien life not on the Earth but in outer space simply to observe? Service. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, you know, that's a little bit of a self-centered point of view, isn't it? I mean, gosh, the aliens, uh, you know, their number one priority is to observe us. Uh, I, you know, I kind of wonder whether the dinosaurs thought the same way, right? Or maybe the trilobites. They think, well, we're the number one life form here on planet Earth. Maybe the aliens are visiting Earth to, to watch the trilobites. I don't know. I mean, but that's a sort of a sociological question. The idea that there might be artifacts on the moon left by somebody who was there, you know, two billion years ago or two million years ago, I mean, that's not nutty. I mean, it's, you know, it's an interesting idea, but there's no data to support it at the moment. On the other hand, we have not dug up every acre of the moon by a long shot. I mean, there's a lot of the moon that we haven't, haven't looked at carefully. And so if there's a monolith on the moon that's buried a couple of hundred feet in the dirt there, uh, we would not know about it yet. But we do have pretty high-resolution photos of, of the moon these days, and we haven't seen anything on the moon that didn't look like the moon. And speaking about the movies, the movie Contact was based on a best-selling novel by Carl Sagan. Have you seen that movie? Uh, many people think that it is the perhaps the most scientifically realistic encounter with an intelligent civilization in outer space. But, well, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I, I have seen it. I've seen it many times. In fact, I was a consultant for the film, as were others here at the SETI Institute. Uh, you know, the first time I saw it, I thought, well, you know, it gets a little soft in the middle. Oh, uh, Seth, we have to take a short commercial break. But after the break, oh. we'll talk about some of the movies that are out there. Do they get it right? How does a scientist view the existence of extraterrestrial civilizations? Once again, our special guest is Dr. Seth Shostak, senior astronomer with the SETI Institute. And you are listening to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, we're talking about how a physicist views alien civilizations in outer space. With us today is Dr. Seth Shostak. So let me ask you a question that I'm sure you've been, you've been uh, given many, many times, and that's the Fermi paradox. That is, if the galaxy is teeming with Earth-like planets, then, well, where are they? How come they don't land on the White House lawn and advertise their existence and usher in an age of Aquarius? What's keeping them? <laughs> I'm all for that. That sounds good to me. I don't know why the aliens would bother, but they, they might do it. Uh, of course, if they actually land on the White House lawn, they're going to get arrested right away. But uh, the Fermi paradox, indeed, is simply a, a, it's a kind of a simple argument that, you know what, the universe is very old. So there's been plenty of time for anybody, 
you know, to colonize essentially all of it. I mean, our galaxy would take 30 or 40 or 50 million years to colonize uh, if somebody was interested in doing that. And, uh, you know, they, I mean, you have to make some assumptions about how fast their rockets are and so forth and so on. But if there was true, if only one society in the whole history of our galaxy decided they were going to make the galaxy theirs, uh, they've had plenty of time to do it. So, so why don't we see aliens everywhere? Why don't we see, you know, the essential, I mean, it's like waking up in Europe in the year zero and looking around and seeing Romans everywhere. I mean, that's kind of the idea. Well, we don't see them. That could mean that nobody's out there. But I think that's that's a pretty big conclusion from a fair, fairly local observation. The local observation being we, we look around the Earth and we don't see too much. We train our telescopes on the skies, and everything we see seems to be nature, not not aliens. So, uh, you know, what, what, what does it all mean? And nobody knows what it all means. It could be that we're looking in the wrong places. It could be that the kind of uh, technology that really advanced societies have – uh, isn't the kind of thing you see through a telescope. It's too small or it's too dark or something. Or it could be that actually colonizing the galaxy is not something that an advanced society is interested in doing. I don't know, but it is an interesting question. Now, my own point of view is that if you're walking through a forest and see a deer or a squirrel, do you go down and talk to them? Maybe initially, but after a while you get bored because they don't talk back to you. And so in the same way, I think that if any civilization can go thousands of light years to reach us, they are thousands of years ahead of us in technology, and we have nothing to offer them. But what about the other scenario that maybe they want to take over? You saw the movie Independence Day, the novel War of the Worlds. What happens if they have malicious intent? Stephen Hawking, the cosmologist, has warned us. Look what happened when Cortez met Montezuma and the Aztecs. It did not go very well for the Aztecs. So do you fear that, or you think it's just a hypothetical scenario? Well, I think that what uh, Professor Hawking was trying to get at was that, you know, there are people who like to uh, like the idea of broadcasting into space. Obviously, SETI is passive. What we do here is we listen, and there's no danger in that. Nobody knows that you're listening, okay? But there are others who want to transmit. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues here at the Institute has been very interested in that, and he has a, an organization to broadcast, and they, in fact, did a broadcast using a transmitter uh, and an antenna near Tromso, Norway, uh, recently, and that generated a certain amount of uh, buzz, if you will, because indeed, maybe it's maybe it's a bad idea to to let any putative aliens know that hey, we're here, right? Because maybe they're friendly and maybe they're not. Well, I don't worry about it because, you know, there's really no stopping letting the universe know that we're here. We have radars uh, and we have television and FM radio. All of these are high frequency signals that go right through the ionosphere out into space, and most of them are fairly weak. But if you're talking about a society that has the kind of rocket technology that would allow them to come here and, and wipe us out or whatever they intend to do, I mean, that, as you point out, that's, that's a very advanced society, and they undoubtedly have big antennas that can pick up all this leakage we're sending into space. So I don't worry about this. I really don't. I think I'm, I'm worried more about, you know, my next dental appointment than I am about this. Okay, and let's take a quick trip to the movies, of course. Aliens are a very popular storyline. Uh, there was one movie that came out where linguists, linguists who are expert in Earth-like languages, were called in because the aliens, of course, didn't speak English, and we had to decode uh, what the aliens are saying and vice versa. But it seems to me that if the aliens are that advanced, uh, why don't they simply use a Google Talk, a software program, to decode the English language? But what do you thought? That's about miscommunication between us and the aliens. Well, on the one hand, you could say it's inevitable because unlike in the movies, they won't speak colloquial American English or any other language we know. That's for sure. Uh, and you could say, well, okay, but, you know, you could, you could still communicate. I mean, think about when Columbus lands on Watling Island in the Caribbean in 1492. I mean, the locals didn't speak Spanish and he didn't speak uh, Arawak or whatever the local language was. But they could communicate a little bit. I mean, you know, they would wave their hands, draw pictures in the sand. I think that you could figure out some means of communication. There are people who, in fact, devise languages to do this. There's a mathematician in the Netherlands who's done this. Well, I, I don't know. Using math is pretty hard. 
a, a pretty hard way to communicate I think. but you know but I think pictures are a good way because you could make a a picture dictionary right and then they could begin to figure stuff out because you can you know you can show a, a star and then you have the word star next to it so they know that that's you know those four symbols there S T A R okay Seth, uh, we have to uh, we have to close this segment of science fantastic uh, once again you are listening to science fantastic with professor Michio Okaku our special guest was dr seth shostak senior astronomer at the seti institute